I'm sewing a pair of pedal pushers and I'm designing some fun shaped belt loops inspired by vintage pants and eventually making my own matching vintage style rope belt, but we'll get to that. While I sew up these pedal pushers, I'll tell you exactly how I designed the belt loops myself in case you'd like to try it too. For this project, I was originally inspired by a 1959 Sears catalog photo showing shaped belt loops and a rope belt on a pair of capris. So I mocked up my idea, and here we are. I'm going to use an out-of-print Butterick pattern designed by Gretchen Hirsch, aka Gertie, a decade ago, Butterick B5895. This is kind of my go-to pattern for cigarette pants and capris and stretch woven fabrics like I'm wearing now, which you can't really see unless I back up. This is a vintage 60s shirt, by the way. I'm using a stretch cotton twill for these pedal pushers. Now I will say right off the bat, I fitted and muslined this pattern to death a decade ago and have made some changes for my changing body shape in the years since then, plus my usual assortment of hacking things six ways from Sunday. So we're just not obsessing about wrinkles and lines around these parts. Pants fitting is a rabbit hole that I can go into and pretty much never come back out of and trust me because I have been there, so sometimes I just have to let some of that go. To more or less quote myself on a blog post I wrote six years ago touching on this topic, I can't always chase perfection and miss out on the good in the meantime. Now let's cut out the fabric. Now keep in mind I'm working with a four-way stretch woven twill fabric. Sometimes I find the selvages tend to not wander the same as the rest of the fabric and end up a bit tighter and it makes the edges of the fabric kind of wavy. So before I cut out my pieces, I clip into the selvage to basically release that tightness to even everything out. You could cut off the selvages too, but I just find this quicker. Then I cut things out, which isn't much initially since I'm not doing the belt loops until later, and there's just not that much to a plain pair of pants. But this is a rare case when you can see me cutting out on the folded layer of fabric. Typically when I use a stretch woven for pants, I use a non-stretch woven for the waistband facing, so this is just a somewhat matching medium weight cotton for my stash that I'm using for the waistband facing. I interfaced the stretch woven with professional fusible interfacing and left the facing as is. And then I did my first batch of pinning. There's only darts in the back on this pants pattern, and while I've modified the front to remove the curve pockets, I didn't add in darts. Since this is a stretch fabric and the torso has a bit of negative ease to it, that works out fine for me. Now, you'll see me switch to my walking foot for a lot of this project because it's great to use on stretchy fabrics so they don't stretch out of shape. I'll link my walking foot video in the description where I give some of my favorite tips for using it. I pressed the darts and waistband seam and then trimmed and graded the waistband seam and then understitched it. Unless I'm doing jeans, I typically like to understitch the waistband at the upper seam and then later top stitch it shut to the leg pieces on the lower seam. I also added fusible stay tape to the zipper area and I'm doing a side zipper on these, though you could do a center back zipper if you prefer. And I filmed this part in slow motion on accident, but I also pressed up the seam allowance on the lower edge of the waistband at this point. I wanted to take a second and talk about pants assembly because I think that assembling legs is just needlessly confusing in some modern patterns and probably some vintage ones too. So I'm going to share the method that I use and this is both from a vintage trouser pattern that I have and also from the closet case files ginger jeans pattern. And instead of sewing inseams together or sticking one leg inside the other leg and sewing the whole crotch seam, you actually assemble kind of as the legs present on your body. So it just, it feels a lot more intuitive and it, I think it's less prone to error. You know, your mileage may vary obviously always, but this is how I do it. So I take both front legs and I sew the crotch seam. And then I take both back legs and I sew the crotch seam. And then depending on if I'm doing a side zipper or jeans with a fly front, either I sew the inseam all in one go, because if I'm doing jeans, I'm probably gonna top stitch that. Or if I'm doing a side zipper, I'll do the side seams first because then I can just do the side zipper really easily with everything open. And then I do the inseam. So basically it's sewing the legs together at the crotch for both the front and then the back and then sewing the sides together and sewing the inseam, either the sides first or the inseam, whichever way you prefer, depending on how you're finishing things. And that's it. There's basically no chance that you're accidentally gonna sew a back to a front leg together or anything like that. And it's just, it makes it so much less confusing to assemble this way. By the way, please take a moment to subscribe and like my videos when you watch them because it really helps me grow my channel. 
So then it's off to pin together the front legs at the crotch seam and the back legs at the crotch seam and sew those two seams. One important extra step on any pair of pants is to reinforce that crotch seam and this is a feature in both modern and vintage pants patterns. You sew a line of stitching just next to the seam line inside the seam allowance, either between the front and back notches or just the entire crotch seam altogether. I usually go between the notches. You'll also need to either trim down the seam allowances between the notches if you're pressing your seam allowances open, or what I do is clip into the seam allowances just like clipping into a curve on an armhole or something, and then I finish it in one go with my serger. And I give it a good press, pressing the trimmed down serged seam allowance to the side. And time for the zipper. So this is a little out of order here because I initially was going to do the lapped zipper in the same way I do for dresses because I forgot that I don't get as good of a result using that method for pants, so I later scrapped it. What I'd normally do here is pin the left leg and baste down to the end of the zipper stop, then sew the rest of the leg normally. But you're just seeing me do the rest of the leg here. I sewed that, trimmed down the seam allowances, finishing it on my serger, pressed it to the back, and then started to install the zipper and then unpicked it. <laughs> and then did the real way I like to do lap zippers for pants side seams, which is the first lap zipper method that clicked for me years ago, even though I just reserve it for pants and sometimes skirts now. This method is a bit harder to wrap your brain around, but the results are really great because you baste shut the seam line of the zipper seam first. And that means with a stretch woven, there's no chance of dimples or stretching one leg and not the other or anything like that. It's basically a foolproof finish. I lay the zipper dead center on the pressed open basted zipper seam line and then hand baste along the zipper tape attached to the back leg. That's on the left side as I look at it from above at this point with the zipper tab at the top. Now I don't need to do that hand basting step, but I did it to show you to basically make sense of the next step. Cause then you flip everything over so that all you see is the zipper and a little bit of the back leg right up against the right side of the zipper tape. And you sew along this edge. I put a few pins in first just to make it nice and flat before sewing with my zipper foot. By the way, yes, I'm using a longer zipper than needed. I just hang the end off the top and cut it off after I sew the waistband seam. Now I pull out the hand basting and the zipper now lays flat against the seam line attached to the back leg. I flip it over and give it a good press, then top stitch on the left side, which is the front leg. And while this method of inserting a lap zipper is a little bit more finicky, which is one of the reasons why I don't prefer to do it for dresses anymore, you cannot deny that it leads to a perfect looking zipper and nice and flat. It only looks weird here because I wet it to remove my chalk line, but it's perfect, not wavy or anything. So nice and easy to get the top stitching straight. All I have to do now is remove that line of basting stitches. And that's what I do next. So just unpick those basting stitches in that seam line. And then I have a perfect looking lap zipper in a stretchy fabric. And I can move on to the rest of the leg seams. I pin the right leg side seam and the entire inseam together all at the same time and then sewed both of those seams. Then I finished those leg seams on the serger and pressed those seams towards the back. This is why I love this assembly method for pants. I'm never like, what am I even sewing here? Which it can sometimes feel like with other construction methods. I also like this method because if I need to make adjustments to the inseam, I can just do that all in one fell swoop. Am I foreshadowing? Yes, I am. Then on to the waistband. I assemble all of my waistbands in this method. I pin the entire waistline seam, letting the seam allowances hang off the ends, which I have marked with notches. I actually use slightly different lengths of waistbands depending on the fabric and use, so I just have some extra on my pattern piece beyond what I need for the underlap side of the waistband, so I just cut off whatever I don't need in the end. I sew this seam and then press it up towards the waistband and trim and grade the seam allowances. Though depending on the fabric, I sometimes don't bother to trim and grade it at all, I just press it up. Then on to the waistband ends. There are different ways to deal with them, but here's how I do it. I fold back the seam allowances with the right sides together. I like to actually sew this from the wrong side, so on the front leg I can start the seam line right at the edge of the zipper. I just find I'm more accurate in having that line come straight up from the side seam that way. 
I mark this and a little trick I do is I angle this seam line out just a smidge towards the top of the waistband, basically angling it away from the waistband. Because when I turn it all to the right side, I find that corner likes to angle towards the waistband a bit and not make it as straight of a line up from the side seam due to the turn of cloth, even after trimming and grading it. So I counteract that with my little seam line here. Just a little thing I've devised over time to get this a little nicer looking. For the lap zipper side, which is on the back leg, I just mark where I want the underlap to end and that'll be my seam line. Usually an inch to an inch and a half, depending on if I'm using a button or a hook and eye as a closure. Then I just sew those two short waistband ends. And you can see what I meant about sewing the waistband end on the front leg from the wrong side so I can get that line of stitching right up against the zipper tape here. Then trim down the seam allowances and if you're a corner clipper, clip towards the corner. Depending on the fabric, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. I just kind of go and see what I get a better result with and then I go with that. And then I give it a good press. Then I just need to pin the waistband facing down since I'll use my edge stitch foot to top stitch this shut, though you could do it by hand. Then I just press the finished waistband and move on to hemming the legs. Rather than trying to cram small tubes on the free arm on my machine, I always turn them inside out and sew them that way, much easier. And I have my basic pair of pedal pushers ready and they are ready to adorn with belt loops and the rope belt. I did make a couple of adjustments to these. I have apparently zero idea how long my legs are. Well, actually, I know how long my legs are. I don't know how long my pants legs are. So I ended up cutting these two and a half inches off, even though I'd already folded up the pattern piece three inches, thinking maybe that was in the ballpark of pedal pushers. It was not, but now we are in pedal pusher department after the additional two and a half inches off. And I also ended up taking the inseam, the entire inseam, in a total of three quarters of an inch just because I felt like the legs were a little bit baggy on me. It's kind of hard to tell when you use stretch fabrics. They all act differently. So I'm happy with how this fits now and I am ready to make belt loops and then also figure out how to make a rope belt for this. So here's my waistband and I roughly just kind of drew out a first pass at what I thought would be good for these little shaped belt loops and so I trace that off, gave myself a quarter inch seam allowance and I'm going to use that as a starting point and whatever I settle on I will give you the dimensions so if you'd like to do this you can do the same but it may take a little bit of trial and error to decide if I like this or not so let's cut this out and find out. With my teensy little pattern piece, I cut out my prototype and sewed one up as a test. Okay, so here is my prototype. I used the facing fabric, which is just a quilting cotton on the back. And I'm actually quite happy with this size. The length is a little bit more than I needed, but basically the way this will work is I will place the beginning of the points just below the end of the waistband. And let me just clip this so I can show you. And then I will secure it with a little white vintage button. And that will tie together with the rope belt that I have yet to figure out. <laughs> but there will be three of these on the back, one in the center back, two kind of off to the side, and then two on the front as well. And if you'd like to do something similar with any size waistband that you have, here's how. The height of the pattern piece from the top to the start of the pointed part is the height of your waistband plus about 3 8 inches at the top to fold under when you sew it on. The width of the piece is however wide you want your belt loop. Mine ended up 1 and a quarter inches wide plus a seam allowance on either side. And the pointed end, well that's really up to you. I eyeballed what I liked frankly, but this gets a seam allowance on either side too. And when you sew it, you leave the top open and just sew down one long side along the two diagonal parts and back up the other side. Then you press it and trim down the seam allowances and trim the corners, turn it right side out and give it all a good press. You can finish it off with top stitching if you'd like. I also searched the raw top edge of the belt loops, but it's not really necessary. I'll talk about that in a minute. Then I tested where I wanted to place the loops, and this is kind of up to you too. I used quilters, clips, and pins to secure them and a seam guide to make sure that they were even, and then I tried the pants on again. 
In fairness, I've made a lot of jeans, so I was satisfied with my test placement right off the bat, even uh, if I did discover I should have tapered off the ends of my back darts a little bit more. <laughs> Oops. I then chalked both sides of each belt loop onto the waistband so I could remove them and gave them a good press to the folded and turned under edge at the top. Unlike how I clipped them to try them on, the turned under part will go on the outside of the waistband, which is why I left about 3 eighths of an inch at the top free to fold under. This part will get sewed to the waistband to secure it. So I pressed that end in before deciding how I wanted to sew these on. Keep in mind that I'm making up some of this as I go, but I first ran a line of basting stitches across each belt loop to secure them to the waistband just where I wanted them. Then I flipped the waistband to the inside and ran a line of stitches at a normal stitch length right towards the top of the waistband to secure the loops on permanently. And then I unpicked the basting stitches. You might find all this overkill, but I tried this all a couple of ways and I like these results the best. I did decide here to clip off the ends first to make sure they're totally hidden by the belt loop. And then I flipped the pants to the right side again to secure the end underneath with a zigzag stitch. The lower edge is where I'd surged, so obviously it wasn't really necessary if you sewed the zigzag stitch right at the edge like I did. And here's what it looks like up close once that's done. If I was using a thinner fabric, I could have used a narrower turn under and probably just finished with the zigzag and called it a day, but I'm very happy with how this turned out for me. Then I just gave all the belt loops a press, and all that's left on these pants is sewing on my little vintage buttons at the bottom of each belt loop. Next stop is making a matching vintage style rope belt for these, but that's going to be a tutorial in my next video. In the meantime, these look super cute with this 1950s belt and my hand knit Poison Girls Jailbird blouse. The shaped belt loops are a really fun touch. I'm definitely sensing more embellishments in my future. Check out these other two videos for more vintage sewing with me, and I'll see you next time.